introduce himself. All right. Thank you all for uh, sticking around for our, uh, one of our latter sessions today. Uh, I'll do my introduction in just a second, but before I begin, I want to start off with some story time. So close your eyes, or if you may, just imagine this, all right? Roughly about a year ago, uh, February of 2016, in the steamy hot town of Manila, Philippines, a gentleman walks into a very busy casino, walks up to the counter, makes a withdrawal request. They take a look at his documentation. It all checks out. It's a little big of a transaction, but again, it all checks out. They load up his suitcase with a very large sum of money, and the gentleman just disappears into the night, never to be seen or heard from again. Over 6,000 miles away in the Philipp or, uh, Bangladesh, the central bank of Bangladesh had just literally been robbed for $81 million. That's right. This was the largest bank heist in the history of the world. And this gentleman right here, unfortunately, had to suffer the consequences of his lax internet or his lax network controls. Ended up, uh, this man's name is Atur Rahman. He was a central governor of the Central Bank of Bangladesh. He was just one of many victims of bank heist uh, perpetrated against the SWIFT network. Now, the SWIFT network was originally conceived in the 70s to facilitate banking transactions between other. Uh, banking institutions. They do roughly about 25 million transactions a day. And we've seen a new rash of attacks uh, against this SWIFT network. What we're finding is, is the SWIFT network in and of itself is a relatively secure system. It's the controls around and access to the SWIFT network, which are often over lax in oversight, and that's where these attacks are happening. What happened in this particular situation was that it was not a technical control that discovered this, but an actual uh, oversight. Uh, they, they discovered a typo in the bank transaction. Five transactions were successfully went through. There was over three dozen transactions that ended up being stopped. If the transactions had all gone through successfully, the bank highest amount would have amounted to over $951 million. What happened was is the word foundation in the transaction was actually misspelled. It was misspelled as a fundantion. Um, and so that's how we were able to discover and stop, to some degree, the largest bank heist in the history of the world. Again, my name is uh, Andy Thompson. Uh, I am the strategic advisor for CyberArk Software. I really have a really cool job in that I just get to help people. And so I, I really absolutely love that. Uh, got an information systems degree from the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, have a CompTIA Plus, Security Plus, SSC, PISS, uh, CISSP, and uh, I think two, three weeks ago I got my G-Pen from GX, so I'm pretty happy about that. Happily married, and I'm a member of the Shadow Systems Hacker Collective and Dallas Hacker Systems out of Dallas, Texas. So, um, If you guys saw my talk earlier, so these are the same slides, but the real hacker in my family is my wife. She's a travel hacker and uh, is able to get incredibly, amazingly cheap trips. So that's, uh, she's the real hacker. Uh, very similar is my little tiny doppelganger, that's Kinley. She likes to travel and run, very similar to her mom. And then there's my little doppelganger, the little hacker. This is Charlotte. That's her keyboard that she sleeps with. Yes, his name's Typey. So we're going to give this talk, it's really a two-half talk, okay? Uh, it's going to be red team starting off, where we're actually going to demonstrate a golden ticket attack and we're gonna do it from the initial inception of the uh, macro. If you came to the previous talk where they were discussing macros, this is a very simple, non-obfuscated macro, uh, all the way to where we actually execute our end game. Uh, the next phase of the talk is really a blue side of a talk where we talk about identity access management best practices and how any one of those individual controls could have been applied in a way that would have stopped the attack that I previously demonstrated. Uh, then we'll open it up to some Q&A and whatever you choose to do afterward is up to you. So, this is a golden ticket attack. Um, this is a whole proof of concept that I've done in six minutes, but it would have been four if I was any better at typing. I'm absolutely terrible at typing. Uh, there's a couple of disclaimers before I really begin. The first thing is, is that this is a s simulation of the bank heist on Bangladesh, but it didn't actually really go down like this. In reality, law enforcement found out that there were two other APT players in, uh, bedded in the Bank of Bangladesh at the time this uh, attack went down. So it was this Asian crime syndicate, um, the North Koreans and the Iranians were all in this same network at the same time. It was just the crime syndicate uh, that was the one to pull the trigger and execute the in game first. Um, they've done some further analysis on this particular attack and they've discovered 
They haven't quite identified it directly, but they assume that this money that was uh, taken from the bank ended up being channeled to Abu Sayyaf and ultimately through ISIL. So this money could have actually gone to fund terrorism. The other thing is, is there's absolutely one, more than one way to skin a cat here. I chose to use the exploitation framework PowerShell Empire, but you could have just as easily used Metasploit or native tools. And even within that, uh, there are many different functions that we could have done even inside PowerShell, Expo or PowerShell Empire to do the reconnaissance and lateral movement. Uh, User Hunter is a really good function within PowerShell Empire. It just didn't work in my demo, so I didn't do it. And then lastly, we're not dropping any zero days. This isn't any elite hacks or anything. This is very simple stuff, all downloaded off the internet. And I often joke, it's so easy, you don't have to be a 400 pound hacker in your mother's basement to do this. All right, so golden ticket attack. Who's here familiar with the golden ticket attack or Kerberos? Okay, let's get a couple volunteers. I saw you raise your hand. Can you come up here real quick? Uh, Steve, come on up here and I need one more volunteer. You, yes, come on up here. I have a previously highlighted script for you to read, and my domain controller here's some tickets for you, okay? Okay. So you guys go ahead and read your script. Hi, I'm Bob. I want to access a file on the file server. Hey, Bob. What's your password? My password is bsites underscore Iowa underscore is underscore awesome. Your password is very good. Very good. Here's your ticket. Hi, file server. I'm Bob. I want to access a file. Here's my ticket. I've got your ticket, so that means that the domain controller says you're good. Okay. You're fine. There you go. That is, in, assess, in essence, what a Kerberos exchange is. The domain controller validates the uh, credentials, gives a ticket, and the ticket is what generates access. Okay? So this is what a golden ticket attack essentially is doing here. Woo! That is a golden ticket attack. Thank you. I'll clean this up later, I promise. Thank you guys for, uh, for coming, I appreciate you. Give them a round of, hand, uh, round of applause, thank you. All right, so that was the golden ticket attack and that's just part of the advanced target attack. What is an advanced target attack or APT? It's really just the fact that they have an act, bad actor or a, what is it, a, a threat actor from the previous talk. Um, embedded in your organization for a significantly long period of time and to the point which they know the ins and outs of your network and your infrastructure better than almost you do. This is in direct contrast to what we've seen with other types of attacks. We have the distributed denial of service attack, not an, AP, not an advanced attack. Opportunistic attacks such as ransomware, where they don't care who you are but you're still being attacked, not an advanced targeted attack. We, the closest thing we see to that is the, what we call a quick targeted attack, which is those gentlemen calling from Microsoft wanting to help you fix your computer. Um, again, you're a target, but it's a, not a long-term uh, uh, attack. Um, we're talking now about the phases of an advanced attack, and what you're going to notice here is this exactly correlates to your red team, uh, a, a APT attack, and most importantly, your penetration testers. The only difference is, is that penetration testers have a much shorter runway, whereas their operation is going to be, what, two, three weeks tops? These advanced actors can do two, three years in your network. So, but here's the key is the phases are still the same. First one is starting off with the inter or external reconnaissance, learning about the organization. The second is followed by the breach, which is what we'll do with the macro. Followed by internal reconnaissance, learning about the network, learning about the systems on the network. Lateral movement is basically pivoting to those other endpoints and expanding your scope of influence and your access. Once you've established the amount of access that you need to execute an endgame, it's a matter of establishing your permanency in your network. This is the domain compromise and where the golden ticket attack comes into play. And then the last is execution of the endgame. So let's start with the uh, first phase of breach rather than an external reconnaissance. Let's assume we've already done that. What we're going to do here with PowerShell Empire is craft an email attachment with a macro and uh, demonstrate the execution of it and then uh, getting into your network. So we'll first start off here. Again, the only tools we are using here are PowerShell Empire and the embedded tools within it. This is a demonstration of a standard user. It's a Windows 7 machine. The standard user account happens to be local admin on the machine, but doesn't necessarily have to. The end user opens up the Excel macro, or the Excel document, the macro is executed, 
and you'll see that a shell is established on my uh, command and control back end. So there it is. Now what we're going to do is interact with that uh, shell. And now that we know it's got uh, local admin rights, we need to try to bypass the UAC. Using a function called bypass UAC, cleverly named, we're able to execute a second shell with bypassed UAC permissions, meaning that we can execute commands that require elevation without prompting that screen to pop up on the end user's machine. So we've gone ahead and we've done that. We're interacting with our newly established shell and we can commence the rest of this attack. So again, now we've got our breach head into the organization. Now it's a matter of moving to the next step, the lateral movement, I'm sorry, internal reconnaissance phase. This is now where we need to learn about the network, learn about the people on the network and the people that we want to attack. You want to go after the people with the most privilege. Systems administrators and domain admin access is really ultimately what you want to get when you're dealing with a golden ticket type of an attack. So what we're going to do is we're going to run several commands to learn a little bit more about the organization and then how to pivot to it. So we're going to go back to the uh, recorded demo. I didn't bring any chickens with me to sacrifice for a live demo, so we'll just have to deal with the recorded session. So we're going to interact back with our elevated UAC agent. I did find out that uh, tab autocomplete works, so that would have gone a little bit faster for me. What we're going to do is we're going to run the module get group members, okay? We're going to define that the domain administrators group within Active Directory is the group we want to look at. We could look at any group, but for this purpose, we want to find out who the domain admins are. We press execute, and we're provided a list of the domain administrators. In this particular POC, there's only two domain admins, but in an enterprise organization, you'd have significantly more. The next thing that we would want to do is find out what sort of computer objects are in play. What uh, machines can we possibly pivot to? Uh, using the function command get underscore computers within PowerShell's uh, PowerView uh, platform, we're provided with a list of all the computer objects that are on the network. Very simply done, you press execute and then you're provided with a long list. Uh, in this circumstance, there were really two machines that were of uh, value, the file server and the Swift server. The Swift server is completely locked down. Nobody has access to it. File server, on the other hand, file servers are an interesting situation for a penetration tester because the NTSF permissions tend to be a little bit different than what you'd see with a normal application server. So file server is an interesting target. Now we're going to run the get local group command, and we're going to find out who the administrators are on that particular file server. So we define uh, the file server name as the uh, server name as well as local admins. We're provided with a list now. What you'll see is that the same user that I, we originally compromised also happens to be an administrator on that file server. Um, that may or be not, may not be the case, but you can still uh, use that information for your reconnaissance. The last thing what we're going to do is run the function get logged on. What this does is it does just what it says. It finds the particular target server and it provides you a list of who's currently logged onto that machine. We find out that there's a domain administrator that happens to be logged onto that same file server that conceptually we should be able to pivot to, meaning that if we're able to dump the LSAS or get the hashes, we can then become the domain, con or domain administrator. So that's the reconnaissance phase of this particular attack. So we now know what server we want to pivot to. We know what credential we want to acquire. It's just a matter of doing it now. That's where the lateral movement phase comes into play here. Uh, what we want to do is we're going to identify that that's the file server we want to get to. And so you can do many different ways to laterally move within PowerShell Empire. There's PS exec, PS remoting, uh, through WMI calls. There's many different ways. Um, I chose to use uh, PS remoting for my demo, but any of those would work just as well. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to hop over to that file server, dump the creds, and get the domain administrator hash. Back to the shell. We're going to reestablish a connection with our elevated UAC shell. So we find there's our agents right there. Here's the two shells. We're going to interact with the second one of them. And we're going to uh, copy and paste uh, the, when, uh, the invoke command for the uh, PS remoting. You run that command, execute it, and then you'll see a new shell will instantly connect. This new shell is going to be your file server. So there it is. We've just been able to establish a new shell, and we've laterally moved to our file server. We're going to run a couple of shell commands just to demonstrate that we are successfully on that file server. We're going to run the uh, host name, 
and you'll see that we are indeed moved pivot to that file server. We're going to run who is and still show that we are still that same user, that standard user. We haven't escalated our privileges just yet. So the next thing we want to do is demonstrate credential dumping. So let's see here. Let it catch up with me for a second. Running the creds command, you see there's no credentials stored in the database. We run Mimikatz, it dumps it into memory, so at no, no to not time is it ever stored on disk, we're provided with the credentials. We run creds again, and there we go. There are our credentials in hash and in clear text value. Now it's time to pass the hash. So now that we have the password and the hash of the domain administrator, we're going to pass the, steal the token and pass the hash and have a process running as the domain administrator, meaning that we can do anything the domain can, administrator can do. We can do it now too. So now we have established uh, the persistent or the access that we need on this attack. Okay, we've got pivoted access to the file server and have acquired access to do any domain administrator functionality. It's now time to move to the compromise phase. This is where we establish our persistence. That is such a hard thing to say, try it. Establish persistence or permanent persistence is even better. So what we're going to do now is the actual golden ticket attack. And it all resides around the Kerberos hash. It's a one-time hash in your uh, Active Directory domain. Meaning that if that Kerberos hash is exposed, there's really only one way to recover from it. It's to tear all your domain controllers down, disjoint every single endpoint from your domain, reestablish a new do domain, and reaffiliate all your machines to the domain. It's a pain, and in most enterprise organizations, that's irrecoverable from. It's, it's almost impossible. So we're going to steal the Kerberos hash, and it's done through a command called DC sync. DC sync is uh, a process when a new domain controller comes online, it reaches out to another domain controller and says, hey, I need all your hashes. All we really care about is the Kerberos hash. So that's how we're going to acquire it. And once we have the uh, uh, Kerberos hash, it's a matter of executing the golden ticket. So let's jump back into the demo. We now have access as the domain administrator. So what we'll do is we're going to define that we want the Kerberos ticket uh, hash um, by running the DC sync command. Once you do that, the DC, domain controller will then send you the Kerberos hash. What you'll see here is when we run creds again, there you go, there's our Kerberos hash. We have all we need to execute the golden ticket. Using the Mimikatz module from PowerShell and our Empire, we're able to run the mim or get gold or golden ticket command. We now have the, it references the Kerberos ticket, which we've acquired, and we get to name the golden ticket uh, and the duration how long we want. Uh, you can have it up to 99 years to do one. I happen to choose the golden ticket name, Hack the Planet. So, all we've, once we've defined all the required parameters, we press execute and we have generated a golden ticket. We have established permanent persistence on the network. So now we previously couldn't get into the Swift server I mentioned earlier. Now we have access to list the file contents uh, where we previously couldn't. So now we've established our permanent persistence on the network. We have acquired the access that we need. Uh, we've done our reconnaissance. There's really only one last phase in this advanced attack, and that's execution of your end game. Uh, depending on what your motives may be, it may to be to uh, disrupt the functionality of the application in a full denial of service attack. Uh, you may want to do what we're going to do, and uh, we're going to compromise the integrity of the data in the transactions. There's many different end games, but again, this is what we chose to do. We're going to access the Swift server, locate the pending transactions, and inject our fraudulent transaction into the batch queue. So back to the demo, and what you'll see is Previously, we didn't have access to this file server. This is just a directory holding batch transactions that are queued up, ready to go at a certain time. Uh, we happen to manipulate one of the uh, Swift transactions. And this is what a, a legitimate Swift transaction would look like, with the exception that $50,000 isn't going to the Shadow Systems Hacker Collective. Once you do uh, upload the file into the batch queue, it's bypassing any manual, like human eyes, as far as uh, controlling that, it's automatic. And it's just a matter of executing the batch job that would normally automatically run. It processes it, and there you go. $50,000 richer to the shadow systems. Yay. There's only one last thing to do here, and that's profit. So 
<laughs> oh, well, that can, that's like the total red side of the talk, right? So that's how we actually demonstrated the talk. Really yes? So obviously, breach admins in one talk, but you're leaving a trail for the forensic side. Oh, heck yeah. This is the lousiest, like noisiest attack you could ever imagine. Uh, but it still happens, and so many organizations don't have controls in place that can even detect loud, noisy, amateur attacks like I just demonstrated. But yes, very good point. There are a lot of telltale, telltale indicators of what's been ha happened here, and that really good, very well segues into the next part of this talk, our identity access management best practices, really how we could have gone to prevent this uh, and notified us of it happening as it's in play. First is the fact of endpoint and least privilege. The first thing that we made as a mistake was having a local end user with local administrative rights on the endpoint. So that would have probably been the first thing that I would have done. So remove the, the local admin right from the end user. Uh, but there are certain cases in which a user needs their local admin rights to run critical applications, right? Well, there's, I, there's uh, least privilege solutions out there that can elevate those particular binaries, but still leave the underlying user in a non-administrative state. So again, removing local admin. Uh, allow the application that do need, do need elevated rights to run, but still let the underlying user re retain their local uh, standard user permissions. The next thing is application control. Even though they may have access to run it, we may want not to allow that. So blacklisting, whitelisting, graylisting are very important. To allow unauthor or to block unnecessary applications from running, but allowing the approved applications to run through. Now this really isn't an identity access management best practice, but I still think it worth being mentioned, and that I think network segmentation is a huge control to protect against lateral movement in particular. So again, not really a best practice, but a good recommendation. What this does is if you can segment your network to the point where they cannot pivot uh, to those critical assets using standard protocols and having controls to monitor the protocols that you do allow, that will provide some level of protection. The next thing is, is if you do have network segmentation, you still need to access those resources. So I recommend you using uh, jump servers or proxy bastion hosts to allow for access of your sysadmins to uh, administer uh, sysadmin your critical assets. Uh, because if you do that, then those hashes won't reside on the endpoint. They'll reside on the, uh, the jump servers. Because you can't pass a hash if you can't get the hash, right? And then lastly, with jump servers, you are provided a level of accountability and auditing. So you can actually see what's being done with those accounts on those, uh, those endpoints. So that kind of leads me to the next point of credential management. Securing and managing your privileged credentials. I love this guy. I changed all my passwords to incorrect. So whenever I forget, it says, Hey, your password's incorrect. <laughs> but seriously, there's three main components to a secure password. The first is uniqueness. If you don't have, uh, if your passwords are the same across your enterprise, that means you can leverage that same password across your entire enterprise, making pass the hash super, super easy to do. Unique values mitigate that. The next thing is complex passwords. Maximizing the, the ability of compl the complexity of your password really thwarts brute forcing and password cracking. So that's great, but you can still use a hash in the event that it's been cracked. So that's why we follow it up with the next phase, ever-changing, frequently rotating passwords. So for example, if you have a password that takes a month to crack, but that password's changing once a week automatically, that renders by the time that password's been cracked, it's changed twice over. So that's why we want those three tenets of a complex password. The next thing, and we've talked about this several times over throughout our conference th today, is multi-factor. It's uh, truly imperative to tie the identity to the account that's being used, and you can really do that with multi-factor authentication. And now this is a concept called a credential boundary. This is really cool. Um, it's really just, we're gonna, do, we're gonna combine uh, what we call functional accounts and credential boundaries to show you a, what a mature credentialed network would look like. It looks something like this when we talk about credential boundaries. We're talking horizontal, I'm sorry, vertical boundaries. This is your tier zero infrastructure. These are your domain controllers, EXXI hosts, domain name servers, you name it. These are your, correlate to your tier zero uh, control app that. Your tier zero assets in your disaster recovery program, okay? So those domain credentials only operate at that level. If your SIM detects that they're being used anywhere outside of those tier zero assets, that will be an incident that needs to be uh, remediated. So we put a boundary right here. You can't really see it very well, but it's there, trust me. The next is you have your application server layer boundary. Again, you have application server credentials that only operate within those boundaries. If you see it up above, 
then that's a red flag. If you see it below, down in the tier two, which is your endpoint layer, then you have potential indicators of compromise. So make sure that you segment your network vertically with credential boundaries. Now here's a really key concept here, and I touched on this just a second ago when I mentioned multi-factor, okay? Identities. Identities are you, me, everybody in this room. They're human beings, blood and flesh, right? Okay, an account, not an identity. These are just hex values that define permissions. That's all they are. These are not one and of the same. You don't need to have a one-to-one -one relationship of your passwords to your people, okay? Think of it like this. This is a construction site. Does everybody in a construction site have a hammer? Maybe. A skill saw? Probably not. A bulldozer? Heck no. Absolutely. It doesn't make cost-effective sense. So what you do is you have a tool chest, okay? You go to the tool chest, you pick out the tool that you've been assigned to use for the job that you've been assigned to do, you use that tool, and you put it right back for the next person to use and hold it accountable. That's what we want to start considering our passwords are and our credentials. So think of it like this, okay? Here are five systems administrators, okay? They're using their standard low-level AD permissions to log on, but we needed them to do administrative functionality, so we provide them a secondary account. Uh, I've seen an ADM or bang account, star accounts, you name it. But it delineates the fact that you've doubled the number of, of accounts in your organization. We've gone from five to ten. Now we have five privileged accounts that we need to be concerned with. What I would recommend you do is still have those same five users, same low, non-elevated accounts, but each one of them check out one privileged account. So we know for the fact that we're granularly controlling it from a password complexity, frequent rotation, and uniqueness. So they just check it in, check it out whenever they need it. So what we've done is we've gone from five privileged accounts down to one privileged account. So I highly recommend that functional account model uh, for administrative users in particular. So I've demonstrated the horizontal tiered boundaries and the functional account model. This is what it kind of boils down to when you look at it from a high level perspective. That. So we go from unbounded, completely flat, to horizontal boundaries and functional boundaries. Throw on a little least privilege and application control, that is a secure, secure network. So that is really the credential f functionality there. Let's talk about monitoring, okay? Monitoring of their privileged users. Uh, this is applicable to your administrators as well as your third parties. We mentioned earlier that Target was victim to a third-party HVAC vendor. Um, we can't speak to the, uh, the security of our third parties. Um, so we have to protect ourselves because our vendors aren't going to do it for us. So I recommend uh, having your privileged accounts being managed by either internal or external, being channeled through a process in which you can monitor them. Uh, something like this, if we're talking about SIM integrations as well, could have detected a lot of the indicators in our previous attack. Specifically, if we were able to detect a DC sync, that would be without a corresponding change control for standing up a domain controller, that would be a pretty clear indicator. Uh, last, behavior on, uh, alerting on behavior anomalies. So for example, if we have a user that logs on every day, Monday through Friday, their domain, I'm sorry, a DBA, um, but they happen to log in at six in the morning um, from a Chinese IP. Um, without that sort of analytical monitoring, that would, we wouldn't be able to develop a baseline. So you wanna develop a baseline of user behavior from, oh, it could be anything from their VLAN, their IP address, their uh, time in which they're accessing systems, what systems they're accessing. All these can contribute to their uh, heuristic uh, footprint. <coughs> And then, again, monitoring of uh, access of your critical assets that don't correlate to um, your uh, controls that you put into place. Like, for example, if you're using some sort of a, a privileged account security solution and you see somebody is logging on to a database server that didn't correlate to an event where they checked that same credential out in your privileged account security solution, that means somebody's trying to circumvent your control. So those are some of the alerts that you can fire off on. So, in conclusion, there's really four main tiers of controls that we can apply to preventing advanced target attacks. I want you to understand that these are just some of the ones that we've gone over today. Uh, there's not one single solution that will fix anything. If you ever have a vendor that says this is the silver bullet, kick them out because they obviously don't know what they're talking about. 
Uh, defense in depth is really the key to a sound, secure organization. Having multiple solutions overlapping each other, providing redundant controls will provide you with the security you need. And again, it's endpoint privilege uh, from uh, privilege from local uh, least privilege in application control, followed by network segmentation and routing through jump servers, enforcing of credential boundaries, multi-factor authentication, uh, securing and managing your privilege credentials through uniqueness, through frequently changing and maximum complexity of your passwords, and then lastly, monitoring on events and heuristic behavior. So that concludes my talk. Um, I know you probably have some questions, definitely. Identity access management. Uh, it is a new, uh, I wouldn't say new, but it's a new kind of direction that a lot of organizations are taking to dynamically provision accounts uh, and stand them up for use and then deprovision them. It's, it's really a way to hold your accounts accountable. I know that sounds redundant, but you need to be aware of what accounts you have in your organization because quite often what we see is like, for example, when a employee is terminated in the circumstance that they have those two accounts that I demonstrated, HR really only knows about the one. So we will need to be accountable for all the accounts in our organization and an identity access management program, such as like SailPoint would be a good one that would do something like that. Thank you. Catch. <laughs> yes. So are you able to bypass user access control with PowerShell? It's kind of what it looked like yes. in your example. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, which was my understanding is that's how you basically provide access to legacy apps that require local admin rights. Mm -hmm. Using user access to control to prevent users from having like local access. So what would be a good solution to prevent attacks if that's the tool that Microsoft provides? Are you looking at third party or maybe there's later version of Windows Server? All right, let me see if I get this correct, because um, you're talking about how UAC is applied in this demo and what sort of controls can be applied to allow legacy applications to run but still provide the accountability of having user access control? Well, just preventing users from, yeah, getting the, um, so basically they are not providing users the local admin rights, but if you want to let the software run, exactly. also I don't want to see that in my network. Right. Um, I, I try not to make the talk super vendory, but there are applications out there, such as endpoint privilege management, that do just that. Um, they, they, all their job is is to facilitate least privilege for users, elevating the legacy applications that are needing local administrative rights, but still not allowing the underlying standard user to be a local administrator. So again, that would be the, probably a, a, a conversation I'd love to have with you offline. Here you go. I was doing this at a conference in Oklahoma, and I had talked to a guy way in the back, and I chunked it just like Dak Prescott, which was awesome. Go Cowboys. Um, but I totally pegged the projector. <laughs> totally, it was bad. It was bad. Yeah, I saw there was a hand over there. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you. Great recommendations. And the projector play over there. <laughs> hey, I tried. Any other questions? All right. Well, I will be here through the rest of the day. Thank you all for listening to me yammer on. I appreciate it. Have a good afternoon.